Learn your own rules. Oh man, Dinosaur Island. Let me tell you, when this game hit Kickstarter, I was all in. And who wouldn't be? A park building board game where you build your own Jurassic Park? I'm amazed nobody's done it before now, it's genius. It's honestly no surprise to me at all that nearly 6,000 people flocked to it like Tasmanian devils to a hunk of rotting meat. And now that the game's out, everyone's still raving about it. It's maintained an 8 out of 10 rating with over 2,000 entries on BoardGameGeek. That's no small thing. And on top of that, nearly every critic is throwing praise at it, like rice at a newly married couple that just walked out of a Midwestern church. But does the game live up to its hype? Is it the rich, Cretaceous experience we were promised? Let's take a look. But before we get started, I'm not going to go into the rules or give a tutorial or anything like that. There are at least a dozen videos out there already detailing the gameplay and the rules, so if you aren't familiar with how the game is played and you'd like to know before going on, try one of these links and then come back when you're done. To start, let's get Dinosaur Island's greatest strength out of the way, which is Dinosaur Island has incredible premise and excellent aesthetic execution. It's been lauded so much I don't feel like I need to go into much detail here, aside from simply saying yeah, it's excellent. The visuals definitely do transmit the theme, and they do give you the feeling that you're managing a theme park where snotty teenagers and sulky babies can gawk at dinosaurs. But the game doesn't achieve much of a thematic flair beyond that, which I know is shocking since theme is Dinosaur Island's most lauded attribute. It's always been difficult for worker placement games to achieve a really strong theme, and Dinosaur Island doesn't do it well either. Because the vast majority of the game is simply placing workers, everything feels so detached and distant to where even though you begin the game thinking you're John Hammond, you realize a couple rounds in that you're actually Bryce Dallas Howard with an awful haircut. The main reason for this is that building your park is basically an afterthought to the rest of the game. You can drop any tile into any spot without rhyme or reason and never really think about it again. Step right up, welcome to Dinosaur Island. As you can see, our food stands are right here next to the entrance for your convenience. From here, it's just a two mile walk to the nearest dinosaur. Don't forget to stop by the Tyrannosaur pen, which you'll find right next to the Pachycephalosaurus. What? No, that'll never be a problem. I constantly hear this game being compared to something like Roller Coaster Tycoon, which must mean most people haven't actually played a tycoon game. Like Dinosaur Island, Roller Coaster Tycoon is a park management game. That means you do do things like track earnings and hire employees, but the bulk of your gameplay has been actually building your park. You adjust the terrain, build your own rides, situate attractions where you want them, and most importantly you create something personal and unique. At their heart, tycoon games are sandbox games, filled with ways to be creative and express yourself, something that Dinosaur Island just doesn't let you do. Considering the primary draw for Dinosaur Island is to build your own park, this is a major miss. The designers could really have done with taking a chapter from Castle of Mad King Ludwig's book. In castles, the entire game is spent strategically and deliberately building your castle. There's a bit of bidding that goes on in the background, sure, but the focus of the game is on creating your castle. It pulls you in so completely that once the game ends, you don't really care who won, because even if you lose, you still got to spend the last hour creating your own fun, unique castle. I mean, compare either of these castles to this Dinosaur Island Park. Or this one. Or this one. I mean, did those last three all look the same? Well, that's the problem. See, it's a shame, because the game sets up so many potential options to make park construction more interesting and fulfilling. Imagine if you got a bonus for placing a food stand next to a big attraction, or had a special penalty for putting your carnivores next to your herbivores. It would not only make placing, but buying tiles for your park more strategic and more engrossing of an experience. Instead, the vast majority of the game is spent just placing your workers, which could be okay if you had really interesting decisions to make. See, one of Dinosaur Island's main issues is its array of shockingly poor upgrades. There are over a hundred cards and tiles you can buy to upgrade your park, and only a handful of them are really very interesting. The first few times you play, it's not noticeable at all. There's just big stacks of cards and tiles, which is exciting. Odds are you'll only get through a fraction of them in your first game, which makes it look like you have a lot left to explore. But it's all an illusion. After a couple more plays, the variety drops off very suddenly, and you realize that most of the tiles and upgrades do more or less the same thing. A few do give unique and interesting abilities, but so many of them just give you a cheaper upgrade, or a little bit of DNA, or maybe an extra point or two. Now points are necessary to win the game, so of course they're important. But are you really ever excited to buy a sunglasses hut to net you one extra point? No. 
Just like you don't buy the ride designer for the extra point, you buy it for the extra worker. Workers and points are both very functional upgrades. They're very useful. You need them. But there's nothing exciting or memorable about either of them. It's only in the food attraction tiles that we see some really interesting design work at play. You can forego points that you earn from patrons in exchange for extra money. This begs the question, why didn't this kind of utility carry over to other attractions? The fact that rides don't give you any excitement doesn't make any thematic sense, for example. And why wouldn't patrons placed on merchandise stands earn money like food attraction tiles? Given the choice between any of these three, you're always going to pick the food attraction tiles, simply because they give you better utility, they give you interesting choices to make. And this isn't an issue of balance. It's not a matter of saying, oh, the food attraction tiles are just way better than the other tiles. It's clear that the designers made them more expensive on purpose. The point is that they're far more interesting. They give you something to do, a decision to make, something beyond just placing a worker on the board. And what I find really disappointing is this same blandness carries on to the dinosaurs themselves. I mean, they're the main draw of the game. It's on the box, Dinosaur Island. Why would you not make these as awesome as possible? Aside from the name, picture, and DNA cost, each dinosaur type is exactly the same. It's a design choice that I just find absolutely bizarre. Like the designers just couldn't be bothered to come up with unique ways to differentiate each dinosaur. And while we're on the subject, the stats of the dinosaurs themselves don't make any sense. Compare this large carnivore to this small carnivore. Aside from costing more advanced DNA, the large carnivore is better in every way. More excitement, more points, and for the exact same amount of threat. Even the difference in DNA cost is completely negligible because there's options to get DNA around almost every corner. So why pick the small carnivore unless you're simply forced into doing it through sheer lack of other options? What really puzzles me about all of this is that the graphic design for all three classes clearly lends itself to an obvious natural progression. One threat pip for herbivores, two threat pips for small carnivores, and then two for large carnivores? There's space here for a third pip, so why isn't it there? It seems to make so much more sense to make the small carnivores worth two threat and three excitement, and the large carnivores worth four excitement, but three threat. The stat difference between small carnivores and large carnivores is made worse by the fact that it's incredibly easy to get stuck behind and not be able to buy anything but the small carnivores during the crucial early rounds of the game. And that's because of Dinosaur Island's single greatest issue, which is the way turn order is determined. The person who's in last place goes first. I mean, what were they thinking? See, going first in worker placement games is a significant advantage. In fact, sometimes it's the single most powerful ability you can have. That's why worker placement games, particularly those that play over a set of rounds that includes a reset phase, determine turn order by an action space. Those games treat going first as a precious commodity that you have to expend resources to obtain at just the right time. Instead, Dinosaur Island tries to twist it into a quasi catch it mechanic to give the last player a little bit of an advantage. And that's fine in theory, but in execution it just plain doesn't work. Dinosaur Island is one of those games where being the first player really is the most significant power you can have. Being first player lets you, and often only you, get the best upgrades in the game. You get the large carnivores, you get the worker, you get the free enclosure. Oh, is there an objective to build the most rides? You get those rides! Going first is so important in Dinosaur Island that instead of helping out a behind player, it just makes the game devolve into a turtle race where everybody fights over last place. And why not? There's no incentive to be in first place until the very last turn. Being ahead of the curve may get you a couple of objective cards before everybody else, but that often doesn't matter if your opponent can build six or more large carnivores in the last two turns. Now that's not to say that the objective cards are completely pointless. They're varied enough to where they can really change the focus of your game and help you down an avenue of gameplay that you might not explore otherwise. But I've had just as many games where the winner completely ignored the objectives as games where the winner got two or three of them. So it doesn't seem like they're entirely necessary. Similarly, I like the idea of the plot twist as well, but the majority of them don't really seem to change the game up that much. Get an extra worker, there's an extra dice, they're all extremely superficial add-ons. There are a couple that do drastically change the game up quite a bit, but they're far in the minority and I wish there were more of them. The varying lengths are also a really cool idea. But unless you're teaching it to new players, only the long game seems to be worth playing. And even in the long game, right as it feels like things are starting to get going, the game just suddenly ends. Now, bear with me a minute. I've got a few personal gripes about Dinosaur Island's production that I really want to go over. They're not super important in the grand scheme of things, but they're little touches that really kind of bugged me and I feel like they should be mentioned. These issues are mainly with the component quality. 
some of it feels like it was very carelessly or thoughtlessly put together. Now that's certainly not true for all of it. Some of the components are fantastic. The player boards, for example, I love. The oversized dice look great, but other things seem like they missed a quality control check. For example, why do all the dinosaur tiles have the same Triceratops silhouette on the back? Is that because the standard version of the game only has Triceratops meeples? But why would that matter? There's a banner in the corner of each of them that differentiates whether it's an herbivore, small carnivore, large carnivore, but why go through all that trouble if you could just do a T-Rex silhouette, a Velociraptor silhouette, and a Triceratops silhouette? And why are all the dinosaurs hot pink? Especially for deluxe backers, trying to sort through the pile of dinosaurs to find a specific one is a complete pain because they look like a hot pile of bubblegum stuffed to your table. And the game takes up so much room you don't really want to have separate piles of dinosaurs littered everywhere because there's almost no room for them anyway. My guess is cost has something to do with the color all being the same, which to be honest really perturbs me because I could have gladly gone without the pointless pogs, which is in quotes because I remember pogs, and these ain't them. If it meant having something that's actually needed for the game look better. And if just giving up the pogs didn't save enough money for different dinosaur colors, we could have cut back in the size of the coins. I mean, I'm a fan of chunky tactile pieces as the next guy, but we really didn't need them to be so thick that the game had to be banned from prisons across the country. Bye, you bitty got me good last turn. Stuck a shit in my spleen. But you know what? I'm gonna get him back. So I got my dinosaur island. I got these coins. Put them in this sock. And get in that sock. Alright. Now I'm ready to fight Bayou Billy in the cafeteria. Plus, the color of the patrons doesn't match what's listed in the rule book or on the cards. Now, I know this was a mix-up, but to me, it just seems sloppy. And don't even get me started on the... <sighs> so to bring this all together, we come to our number one most important question. Is Dinosaur Island a good game? And the answer is yes. I know it's surprising. I've spent the last 15 minutes moaning and groaning about Dinosaur Island, but it really is a good game. It's not a great game, but it's not a bad game either. It's a light and competent enough worker placement game that's definitely compatible with younger players or those new to board games. That said, it doesn't really fulfill most of what it promises. It doesn't have that park building feel of a tycoon game. And though the game has a lot of breadth, it has very, very little depth. The first few games feel fresh and exciting, like there's so many options out there to explore. But if you play Zen, you realize how shallow the game actually is. But to give Dinosaur Island its due, everybody I've played with for the first time has absolutely loved the game. But by the same token, everybody that I've played five or more times with has all kind of come away with the same feeling. It just doesn't keep well. The game does work replacement as well as any other game, but it doesn't do anything new or anything exciting. Altogether, it's about as beer and pretzels as you can get in a work replacement game. With that consideration, we come to the second most important question. Should you buy Dinosaur Island? It's hard to say. A couple of weeks ago I would have said no, because I firmly believe Pandasaurus had to have a second edition coming out soon, which fixed things like <laughs> Now there's a Kickstarter up for the new expansion and the extreme version, but so far it doesn't seem to fix any of the issues I've had with the game. The only thing that really stands out is the blueprint mechanic, which scores you points if you build your park in a specific pattern. And I find this change completely irritating, since it's a step in the opposite direction in that it dictates what your park should look like instead of leaving creative control up to you and letting potential bonuses and penalties help guide your decisions. I definitely don't recommend backing the game at $80. I just don't think there's enough game in the box to justify that price. There may be enough plastic, but not enough game, especially if you're on a stricter budget. The retail version is far more affordable, so unless you're just really looking for a light worker placement game and you're absolutely in love with the theme, I'd say hold off and pick up the retail version when it hits stores again. Thanks for watching, folks. Game on.